Uh, my name is Michelle Dunn. I'm a senior associate here at the Carnegie Endowment and editor of the Arab Reform Bulletin. I want to begin by thanking our co-sponsor for this event, the Heinrich Bell Foundation, who also brought our visitors from the Middle East. Uh, we have a very special lineup of speakers today to discuss an extremely important topic, human rights conditions in the Arab world and U.S. policies. And I would say that we, today we've got the dream team here to, uh, to address this important topic. Uh, we have Michael Posner, Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I suspect that Assistant Secretary Posner needs little introduction to this audience um, due to his long career as a distinguished human rights advocate, during which he's had many uh, notable achievements, include, including proposing and campaigning for the first U.S. law on political asylum. Before joining the State Department, he was executive director and then president of Human Rights First. And thank you very much, Assistant Secretary, for fitting us into what I know is a hectic schedule. We also have Tamara kaufman Wittes, uh, who is Deputy Assistant Secretary for, the, for Near Eastern Affairs at the State Department, overseeing the Middle East Partnership Initiative and the broader Middle East and North Africa Initiative, among other responsibilities. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Wittes is a well-known expert on the Middle East and particularly on democracy issues there, having been a scholar at the Brookings Institution and before that at the U.S. Institute of Peace before joining the State Department. So we have with us both the functional and geographic bureaus of the State Department, and those of you who have worked at State or with State know that's a powerful combination. So thank you to both of them for being here. Uh, and we're especially delighted to have two very prominent advocates of human rights from the Middle East with us today. Behayadeen Hassan is director of the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies, which is a regional organization. And it is no exaggeration to say that uh, Behay has emerged as the dean of the human rights community, not only in Egypt, but throughout the entire region. Among his many achievements is the publication of the first comprehensive human rights report on the entire Arab region, compiled by a network of Arab organizations, which has been published for the last two years and is available in English as well as Arabic. And we have with us Amal Basha, who heads the Sisters Arab Foreign Forum for Human Rights in Yemen. She also is a longtime <laughs> advocate for human rights and has been recognized throughout the region and within Yemen by uh, a number of awards, including the Asaid Cultural Foundation Annual Prize and Golden Shield for Distinguished Work in Human Rights. She also has extensive experience working in UN organizations. Now, if we'd been having this conversation a year ago, shortly after President Obama made his famous speech in Cairo, I think I might have uh, begun by saying that human rights were nearly invisible in his administration's policies in the Middle East. But I think that is no longer true today. And I'm sure that a lot of the credit goes to Assistant Secretary Posner and to Deputy Assistant Secretary Wittes for their efforts. Um, human rights and democracy promotion indeed have begun to appear on the administration's agenda in the Middle East. Uh, the national security strategy that was issued in May makes a clear connection between U.S. national interests and the expansion of democracy and human rights abroad. It calls for the United States to strengthen the power of its own example and also to practice principled engagement with non-democratic regimes, as well as engagement with civil society and peaceful political opposition. I'm hoping today we're going to discuss in some detail what that really means in practice and also how people from the region view whether or not the United States is actually doing that. In recent months, the Obama administration has also begun to speak publicly about some human rights issues in the region, particularly in Egypt, making statements, for example, uh, criticizing the extension of the state of emergency, calling for investigation of the recent killing of uh, Khaled Mohammed Saeed by security officers 
and uh, 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 criticizing irregularities surrounding the recent Shura Council election. So there are beginning to be a record of public statements now recently from the Obama administration regarding human rights issues in the Middle East. Um, I would say that the Obama administration also has more to work with than its predecessors had in terms of capable human rights institutions uh, in the Arab countries. The, I'm talking about independent organizations. I mean, there are also human rights commissions and government institutions with whom the United States can engage. But I think that the Arab human rights organizations have really started to come into their own. They still face a lot of harassment from their governments, but I think they've gained a lot of credibility <clears throat> among their fellow citizens. Uh, and they've also gained a greater ability to influence public debate via the independent media that have appeared in the Arab world. And we have two uh, very prominent representatives of that trend with us here today. So we're going to begin with some remarks from Assistant Secretary Posner and Deputy Assistant Secretary Wittes about how they see U.S. policy toward human rights in the Arab world. Uh, are we engaging in a truly effective, fruitful way with both government and civil society on these issues in Arab countries? And then we're going to hear from <clears throat> Behe and Amal about the actual conditions in the region and how they evaluate the U.S. Uh, engagement on these issues at this point. And after that, we'll open up for your questions. Assistant Secretary Posner. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Michelle, um, for those kind words and also for uh, organizing this uh, really important meeting. I, I also want to thank the uh, Heinrich uh, Bell Foundation for your co-support and, and sponsorship. Um, the interest in this and the uh, participation from people from so many places is really uh, very encouraging to me. <clears throat> and I regard this in my own tenure as uh, a region and a, and a subject that's uh, as important as anything on which I work. We're at a pit really critical moment, a pivotal moment in a number of countries, Egypt in particular, where I think it's absolutely essential <clears throat> that we be clear about what we're doing and that we, uh, that we act decisively. So I'm going to say something about that. Let me just, if I can, by way of introduction, set the framework um, for the Obama administration uh, and Secretary Clinton's approach to human rights uh, in general, uh, and then focus in on the Middle East region uh, more specifically. Um, there really are three pieces of what uh, essentially frames my job and the, and the job of this administration as articulated by the President in various speeches, including the Cairo speech, but including the Nobel speech and speeches in Ghana and Moscow and elsewhere, and by the Secretary in a speech he gave last December at Georgetown. The first premise of what we're doing and the way we're approaching these and other issues is what we're calling principled engagement. Um, we're engaged in the world in a way that I think um, recognizes that there are going to be differences, recognizes that there are going to be challenges, but says that it's better to be in the middle of the discussion than standing outside. And so, for example, last uh, spring, we, the United States, made a decision to join the UN Human Rights Council, um, which uh, uh, was a decision not taken lightly and, and taken with a recognition that the Human Rights Council is far from being a perfect institution. It's a very challenging institution, but one where we thought it's better to be inside trying to fix it and correct it and assert our, our views and our values than standing on the outside. Last month, uh, or several weeks ago, in fact, uh, my colleague Harold Coe uh, and Steve Ra Stephen Rapp from the State Department went to Kampala to participate actively in the S Assembly of State Parties for the International Criminal Court. The United States initially signed and unsigned our support for the criminal court. We're edging our way back into figuring out, figuring out a way consistent with our national interests how we engage in that institution. There are a range of other examples also on the bilateral level. We're talking to friends and, and, and foes and everything in between. We're engaged in the world. We're engaged on security issues and economic issues and others. But human rights is part of that discussion. That's what principled engagement means. The second piece, which I think is also critical, is a notion that there is a single universal standard for human rights. 
It's not a U.S. standard. It's not a European standard. It's not a Islamic conference standard. It is a universal standard based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It applies to everyone, including ourselves. Importantly, we have to try to hold ourselves to the highest standard so that we can lead by example. The President's decision on the second day of office to issue the three executive orders, ending a policy of official cruelty. Um, I wouldn't have come into the government if that executive order hadn't been issued. It was critical that we said no to torture and all forms of cruel treatment by every U.S. official. It was critical that we made the commitment to close Guantanamo. Much easier to say it than to do it, but we are working on that. And the third thing is to have reasonable, humane rights respecting uh, detention policies in the security context. A huge agenda. I spend a fair amount of my time working on it. They're not easy issues, but there's a commitment to lead by example. We're doing a review to the UN under what's called the Universal Periodic Review at the end of the year. We convened 12 experts, groups from our own civil society um, to prepare for that. This will be our own evaluation of our own performance. We're going to continue to do that kind of self-assessment. We want to lead by example. We want to hold every government to the same standard. And the third piece is a commitment to helping uh, societies change from within. Um, it is, a, I think, a, a, a maxim. It's certainly something I've always believed, that it's impossible, certainly very difficult, to force change from the outside. Societies change from within. But there have to be the building blocks. There has to be the framework. And so when the Secretary spoke last December about a 365-day-a-year approach to democracy, it's not about regime change. It's not about a single day when there's an election, although elections are part of it. It's about building and supporting civil society. It's about free press. It's about access to the Internet. It's about the rule of law transparency, accountability, the right of workers to organize in the workplace, empowerment of women. It's the package of things that we call sustainable democracy. That's what this is about in terms of our mission. And for you all, those of you who've come from civil society organizations in the Middle East, our job, my job, is to make sure that we're doing what we can to allow you the space to operate in your own society and to push for change from within. Where we are today, and Michelle mentioned the national security strategy, we've gone from the rhetoric, which is sort of phase one, and I, I can't tell you, if it's frustrating from, for you on the outside, it's more frustrating on the inside to see how slowly uh, it takes to generate momentum on issues in the new administration. We got the rhetoric down, and now in a directive last month, the president, the government has said we have a national security strategy which is built on four pillars. Security, that one's obvious and, and easy to understand. What we call prosperity, which is about a sustainable development, health, education, science, the like. International order, being part of a, establishing international ground rules. And fourth, values. And the values section is really about human rights and democracy. Uh, the the, the uh, national security strategy says that democracy doesn't merely represent our better angels. It stands in opposition to aggression and injustice. Our support for universal rights is both fundamental to American leadership and a source of our strength in the world. Uh, it goes on uh, to talk about individual right to speak your mind, assemble, worship, etc., and says the U.S. supports those who seek to exercise universal rights around the world. So now we have the rhetoric and the foundation of a security strategy, and now the question is where do we go from here and how do we turn this into reality? Let me talk about the Middle East for just a couple of minutes. We have a range of huge challenges in this region, as many as we have anywhere in the world. We have issues relating to freedom of association and assembly. And to me, this is almost the starting point. There are many countries in the Middle East that restrict the rights of organizations to, uh, to exist, to register with the government, to receive foreign funding. They've, they've sucked the oxygen out. They've made it impossible or very difficult for people to organize 
to advocate for women, for environment, for human rights. We need to be attentive to that, and it is a priority. The Secretary is giving a speech in Krakow on Saturday about this issue. There's the question related to that of what happens to human rights defenders. We had a case uh, just in the last few weeks of a, uh, a man named Mohammed al Hassani in Syria who got three years in prison for a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, for w spreading what the government called false information that undermined national morale. Three years in prison. We get these cases all the time. We have to speak out. We have to make this part of our principled engagement. These defenders deserve and need our support. There are a range of challenges on relating to freedom of expression. Journalists under attack in many countries, bloggers under attack in many countries, access to the internet denied or made so difficult that it's virtually impossible or extremely expensive or both for people to speak their minds. There are cases like the recent arrest in Kuwait of Muhammad uh, al Abdul Qadir al, al Jassim, um, who's in prison for criticizing the Emir. He's in a secure area of the central prison with convict, convicted prisoners. There's a gag order on the media who even want to report on a situation. I was in January, in, in January I was in uh, Egypt, and I raised a couple of cases of bloggers and journalists, among them Hani Nazir. Um, who blogged on religious issues and was detained under the emergency law. Karim Amir, uh, who was jailed in 2006, thrown in jail for four years for denigrating religion. And Musad Abu Fagher, who was jailed in 2007 because he, issued, he made, uh, posted on the situation of the Bedouins. Under the renewed emergency law in Egypt, all three of these people should be released. We're calling for that. We're going to continue to press for that. The emergency legislation itself, we've called for an end to the emergency law in Egypt. We're deeply disappointed that it was renewed on May 11th. There are several hundred prisoners that were released, but there are many, many, many more who need to be released. And we will continue to urge that the government of Egypt repeal the emergency law, which is con contradictory to notions of human rights. The hardest cases are those of people in prison, people who are detained and abused. Uh, several weeks ago in Egypt, a man named Khalid Saeed was dragged out of an internet cafe and beaten to death by police, 28 years old. We've raised this issue publicly. We've called for a full investigation. These are the tests of whether there's a commitment to human rights, and we've got to be resolute. In January, I raised the case of a woman named Mona Thabet, who was tortured in last year by Egyptian police. Uh, the allegation is that both in her neighborhood she was picked up, taken to prison, uh, and beaten there, and then again in her home. We're continuing to press for an investigation of that case. In Iran, we have used every public opportunity at the UN and elsewhere to challenge illegal detention, torture, denials of due process, attacks on civil society, denials of media freedom, denials of religious freedom to the Baha'is and others. Um, we will I was in Geneva last February when the Universal Periodic Review of the Iranian uh, government was presented. We were first in line to speak and raise a range of concerns. We raised them publicly at every opportunity. Uh, the situation there is dire. And finally, I want to say something about elections. The Iranian uh, disputed elections a year ago clearly uh, signaled that the government was totally unwilling uh, to allow free expression of political views in that society. It continues to be the case today. Um, we're concerned also and have raised cons these concerns uh, with the Tunisian government for their restrictions on opposition political parties, political candidates, a range of restrictions on the media and the like. And in Egypt, concerns about uh, reports of fraud and interference in the recent uh, 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 Sharia Council elections. We have two critical elections coming up in the fall for the parliament and the presidential elections next year. This is a test for us. It's a test for Egypt. It's a test for, the, for, for everybody concerned about human rights. This is a moment where we need to be 
uh, calling for an open political process. We need to be calling for uh, independent observers, both Egyptian and international, uh, to be able to observe the process. We need to be providing the support they need to political parties and activists to make sure that people register, that their voices are heard, that the issues are debated openly and fairly. Um, so we're at a critical moment, and I think in some ways, I've mentioned Egypt probably more than any place. I do think we're at a critical moment here, and there are many of us uh, in the administration uh, encouraging, pushing, um, that in addition to our longstanding interests, national interests, in working with the government of Egypt and working on a longstanding relationship, it is critical at this moment that we signal and be there for civil society and for those pushing for democracy and human rights uh, who are engaged in a very uh, timely, important fight, and the United States government needs to stand with them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Wittes. Thank you. Well, thanks, Michelle, um, for uh, inviting me to join you. And uh, I want to thank Carnegie and Heinrich Boll not only for today's event, but for all of the attention that these two organizations consistently give to this set of issues in Washington. And I also really want to thank uh, Bahay and Amal and, and all the rest of the delegation who took time away from their work and came very far uh, to share um, their views and the information that they brought and the insights that they brought with us in Washington. And I know that over the course of the week, you've had a number of engagements with uh, various offices and agencies across the U.S. government, as well as this public event today. So I'm very grateful to you uh, for all of that. Um, Assistant Secretary Posner spoke about the, the roots of uh, this administration's commitment to human rights and democracy and sort of the strategic guidance within which we are doing our work. And what I'd like to do is just talk to you a little bit about some of the w other ways in addition to um, that public dialogue that, that Mike discussed, uh, some of the other ways we're working to put that commitment to, into practice through our diplomatic dialogue with government, through outreach to citizens and civil society, um, also through public diplomacy and public statements, and also working multilaterally uh, with other governments, including in international organizations. Um, I, I think Mike's made very clear that uh, as an administration, we don't accept the notion that there's some kind of contradiction between pursuing our strategic interests in expanding democracy and human rights and pursuing other strategic interests. In fact, as President Obama said last year in Cairo, we see uh, that countries that respect human rights and that are governed by the will of the people are more stable, more successful, and more secure. Uh, and that makes them better partners for us in all of our international endeavors. Um, that also reflects our firm view that security requires more than simply the absence of conflict, that it requires attention to human needs, to human rights, and to human aspirations. And what that means in practice is that even in a region that is beset by pressing security challenges and longstanding conflicts like the Middle East, our overall strategy and our specific policies have to do more than simply work to resolve conflicts and fix things that are broken. Um, we are putting forward a positive agenda across the region, an agenda that's about empowering individuals and communities to control their own destinies, to create their own opportunities, and to build their own future. And as Mike discussed, and very importantly, governments, of course, have a central role in making that agenda for the future a reality and creating the space for those opportunities to exist. Um, so let me just talk about a, a couple of specific cases where I think this approach to the region really um, comes through most clearly. And the first is Yemen. I think Yemen is in many ways a key example of a country where security challenges are tied very, very clearly to the need for political dialogue, for equal opportunity, for more transparent and accountable governance, all of which are in Yemen's own national security interest. The United States supports a unified, stable, democratic, and prosperous Yemen. And we believe the government of Yemen's approach to its challenges has to be a comprehensive one that addresses security, political, and economic challenges together. Our strategy in Yemen seeks to address the root causes of instability, to encourage political reconciliation, 
to improve governance and combat corruption, to build the Yemeni government's capacity to secure its territory, and also to protect its citizens and deliver them the services that they deserve. So all of these are our priorities as we ramp up our development assistance to Yemen in the coming year. And we engage very energetically with the government of Yemen on these priorities, both bilaterally and multilaterally through the Friends of Yemen process to help the Yemeni government undertake necessary reforms and to promote political dialogue as a lasting solution to internal conflict. So that's on the diplomatic side. In addition, through programs like the Middle East Partnership Initiative, which I oversee at the State Department, we engage directly with civil society in Yemen to help them advocate for citizens, to help them hold their government accountable. MEPI actually has 26 active projects in Yemen. We have more uh, local grants to local Yemeni civil society organizations than we do to any other country in the region. And that's a testament to the vibrancy and the diversity of civil society in Yemen. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity to provide direct support for Yemeni citizens' work on the priorities that they identify, from combating corruption to promoting uh, peaceful conflict resolution to countering child marriage. And, you know, going back to what Mike said a few minutes ago, this emphasis on supporting local voices is not an accident. It's a reflection of the forces that are driving change in the Middle East and North Africa. The proliferation uh, of civil society organizations across the region and the um, increased um, opportunities for activists like the delegation that's in Washington today to do their work. We, are, we see our role and our responsibility as empowering and bolstering the work of these activists. We want to amplify their voice. We want to increase their impact. So as we work to shape the political environment uh, to be one in which civic activism um, can operate and have an impact, we also try to use programs uh, like MEPI and others to help uh, these efforts take root. Um, Mike talked a lot about Egypt, and I, I don't want to go on about this at length, but I do want to say that Egypt is another important focal point for our efforts to support locally driven reform. Um, the United States, of course, has a strong relationship with the government of Egypt. We also have a longstanding partnership with the people of Egypt through uh, assistance programs that go back many decades. And it's our firm view that progress in political and economic reform is essential to Egypt's long-term strength and success. So reform is important to sustaining a strong foundation for our continued and valued strategic partnership. Um, Mike mentioned the elections, and I agree that this is an important moment for the government of Egypt, for those of us who care about the future of Egypt. It's also an important moment, a very important moment for Egyptian citizens. It's an historic opportunity for them to express their views about who should govern their country. And it's our view um, that Egyptian citizens alone should decide who will run in Egypt's elections and ultimately who will win. Uh, we've been concerned, frankly, by some of what we've seen so far, and Mike detailed that. Uh, but we think that the elections in the fall and next year are an opportunity for the government of Egypt to address those concerns uh, and to uh, create a process an electoral process in which the people of Egypt can have confidence uh, and be encouraged to participate. Um, you know, this spring at the UN Human Rights Council, the government of Egypt heard recommendations from a number of Egyptian NGOs and from the international community about how to improve the protection of human rights in Egypt. And the US government was an active participant in that process. And the Egyptian government made commitments to the council, including to combat police violence and to investigate torture allegations. Uh, so uh, when we see cases like the case of Khaled Saeed, uh, we realize that the issue of police brutality is still one that requires serious focus. Uh, and we also see an opportunity for the Egyptian government to demonstrate the commitments that it voiced in Geneva to investigate allegations of police abuse, and to hold police accountable. 
There are many active Egyptian citizens and brave Egyptian NGOs who are calling for specific reforms to move the country down the democratic path. And we're committed, committed to sustaining our support for Egyptian civil society. In fact, through MEPI, DRL, and USAID, despite an overall significant reduction in U.S. government uh, bilateral assistance to Egypt, we've sustained and even increased our support for Egyptian civil society organizations uh, and Egyptian civil society in all its forms. Let me close with just one more quick thought about um, one of the things that I see in the region uh, as um, perhaps most significant as we continue down this path seeking to advance universal human rights. And that's, you know, frankly, that the most powerful force in many ways shaping the future of the Arab world is not economic or political or even technological. It's demographic. It's the rise of this coming generation of young people that is going to have a profound and potentially transformative effect on the Arab world. Now, countries in the region already struggle with creating jobs, providing other basic needs for this youth bulge. And youth, for their part, are struggling to carve a path for themselves in societies where access to opportunities is shaped less by merit or hard work than by patronage and the tight relations of family and tribe. I think all of us in the administration recognize the importance of helping this rising generation get the tools and access the opportunities they need to realize their aspirations for themselves, for their families, for their communities, and for their countries. So in a variety of ways, we are working moving forward to develop uniquely tailored programs that support young people as stakeholders in society, that encourage their active participation as citizens, as volunteers, as entrepreneurs, as activists. Um, so woven throughout our work in the Middle East is uh, a commitment to building partnerships with this rising generation and partnerships that are designed to empower youth and the adults who work with them. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Tamara. So we've heard now, you know, from the uh, sort of from the Washington point of view that the um, uh, the U.S. administration is developing its rhetoric on human rights in the Arab world and is engaged in uh, many forms of uh, uh, contact with civil society and so forth now. So now we want to hear uh, from, from the region. What's the point of view from the region? How are uh, conditions, human rights conditions in the region developing? Are these messages from Washington being heard? Are, is, is the United States communicating effectively with governments in the region? Do we see the effects of that or not? Uh, and, and are these contacts with civil society also effective? So uh, we'll, I'll turn it over to Behadeen Hassan. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, very much, Michelle, uh, uh, and for Carnegie and uh, Henrich Paul for uh, uh, hosting this uh, event. Um, I am very pleased to uh, have on the same table uh, not only friends but uh, intimate friends uh, like Michelle and uh, Amal, but also uh, very prominent. Uh, advocates for democracy like uh, uh, Tamara and uh, uh, for human rights uh, uh, Michael Bosner. In fact, I, I am proud to sit on the same table with uh, Michael Bosner, uh, who I consider, I consider myself uh, a student in uh, his school in advocating human rights for uh, several decades. I am proud that I got to know uh, Michael Bosnar for almost two decades, and he was very, very helpful, uh, not only for the cause of the uh, protection of human rights, but also in um, uh, uh, learning uh, and educating uh, very important human rights lessons. Uh, uh, in fact, what uh, I am sure what uh, Michael has addressed as a case is, it is just uh, uh, drops of what he is doing. Uh, 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 but unfortunately, I think that um, uh, the human rights friends in this administration are very little minority. Uh, 
on the uh, when I met, uh, I, I, I have the honor to meet with uh, President Obama on the 18th of February this year uh, with a delegation, another delegation of human rights defenders. Uh, in this meeting, I raised with the president a question. I said, I asked, how long has it uh, been since your historical speech in Cairo? And I answered, the gap, unfortunately, the gap is much wider than a span of seven months. What to say now after uh, one year? Just uh, to look into some of the uh, parts of the uh, statement of the speech. Um, President Obama said the United States doesn't accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. These constructions violate previous agreements and undermines efforts to achieve peace. It is a time for these settlements to stop. End of quote. Uh, what happened on the reality is that the demand to, uh, uh, to end the Israeli settlement uh, construction, it has been shelved. Moreover, the United States refused the recommendation of a UN commission uh, that both Israel and Hamas conduct an investigation into crimes committed during the Israeli attack uh, in Gaza. Which, uh, which is uh, very surprising in this regard because the United States itself several years ago, uh, uh, um, it investigated crimes committed by American soldiers in Abu Ghraib and it did, it, it, it did the same what the United Nations Commission is looking for, it did it voluntarily. Uh, uh, another uh, quote from the president, he said, I do have an unyielding, the, uh, unyielding belief that all people earn for certain things, the ability to speak your mind and have a say in how you are governed, confidence in the rule of law and the equal uh, administration of justice, government that is transparent and doesn't steal from the people, the freedom to life as you choose. Those are just, those are not just American ideas. They are human rights. And that is why we will support them everywhere. And I would like this is the end, uh, end of quote. I would like to underline to support the, the, uh, the sentence or the word to support. So it is not just promoting those rights, but to support. And I don't think that it means only financial uh, support. Uh, on the background of uh, uh, the statement and the speech, what we witness in the region across um, year since June uh, 2009 to June uh, 2010, that uh, the, the region witnessed an int intensification of repression, in fact, in the whole region. Even a country like Morocco, it witnessed a retreat in its uh, 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 limited uh, path of uh, reform, which he started uh, several years ago. It witnessed also witnessed um, increased repression of Shia minority in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. It, it witnessed uh, the bloody government uh, crackdown in South and North Yemen. It witnessed 
rigged or, uh, uh, or uh, remoted elections in several Arab countries at the top of them, Tunisia, Yemen, Algeria, Sudan, and Egypt. <laughs> in his historical speech, President Obama was, as far as I remember, was the first US president to publicly adopt the cause of Copts and name it in his speech and in, in Cairo. <coughs> but the year since then has seen unprecedented sectarian violence targeting Copts, which reached its peak with the Nag, with the Nag Hammadi massacre in uh, January uh, 2010. This year witnessed a new uh, dangerous, very dangerous uh, development. For the first time, human rights, can, uh, human rights defenders in at least three countries uh, 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 received death threat. Uh, in, in this room, two of those human rights defenders are uh, uh, with us. Amal Basha, one of them. Uh, Kamal Gandubi, another one, but there are several other human rights uh, defenders from, um, uh, from, the, the, from Tunisia and from Syria also who received such uh, uh, threat. This is, as I said, it is, <coughs> it is a new development and uh, of course this is just uh, uh, I am just uh, highlighting some uh, dangerous uh, de uh, development on the uh, ground or on the background of the, um, the speech of uh, President Obama. But of course, I don't think that anyone would suggest that such intensif intensification of repression in the region, it is because of the US policy, or this is for the interest of the United States. Uh, I don't think that, but uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, 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 such a deterioration cannot be explained without taking into account the policies and the inclination of the new administration. Moreover, I think that the United States or the administration uh, made three negative contributions to the such uh, human rights, uh, to the deterioration of uh, uh, such a situation. The first one of them is the unconditional support to a regime, the Yemeni regime which is known as uh, a, a bloody, repressive, corrupted regime. And this is, in fact, as, as far as uh, not only human rights uh, defenders think, but uh, also many academicians think that this is even, it doesn't help United States in uh, uh, its fight against terrorism. It helps on the other. Uh, the other way, it, uh, as many analyses produced here by Carnegie and uh, uh, from other uh, think tanks. I mean, it helps to make the environment uh, in, in Yemen more helpful for recruiting more and more uh, tourists. Uh, the second the negative contribution is the blessing to the rigged election in Sudan. This is very uh, negative uh, uh, development in the attitude uh, uh, and the position of the United States towards uh, uh, having free elections uh, everywhere. And even this makes now many human rights uh, defenders think that it is not wise anymore to seek international monitoring for any coming election. They, at least they are reluctant because what happened uh, in Sudan. The third uh, negative development is the, uh, 
um, the, U the US United States adoption of the Egypt uh, Egyptian government definition for NGOs. I would like to underline uh, uh, to, to that the negative impact of such adoption, it is not financially. And even who suffered because of such uh, adoption of, uh, uh, of, this, of this definition, it were mainly some major US-based uh, groups and working in Egypt. Uh, but uh, uh, the main uh, negative impact is the political, uh, is political. It is, it, it is direct support to the enemic or hostile position and the attitude of the Egyptian government towards mainly human rights NGOs. Uh, because of that, now the Egyptian government uh, has almost finished a draft of new NGOs law, which uh, copy and paste uh, such definition. And even some officials said to the media publicly that this is, was blessed by whatever the U.S. Embassy, USAID. Uh, 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 and despite that such a law has not been discussed or passed by the parliament yet, but this is expected with the, after the uh, new election, but the Egyptian government started to implement some provision, provisions or articles of this suggested law. And now several NGOs who are considered by such governmental definitions that they are uh, not legal, so they don't receive funding not from the United States, but even from European sources. So uh, 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 I think uh, uh, maybe Egypt is going to witness uh, uh, after the adoption of this law, uh, uh, that human rights NGOs would and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, human rights defenders would be sent to trials the same like what happens, uh, what is happening in Syria. The case which uh, Michael Bosner uh, highlighted, Mohamed Al Hassani, the main charge against Mohamed Al Hassani, that he established human rights NGO, and this is not the, def the same definition of. Uh, of the Syrian government, and this is illegal uh, NGO. Uh, ah, okay, I, I am about to finish. Uh, just, yeah. Uh, Finally, I would like to conclude by uh, going back to June 2009. In June 2009, after uh, President Obama's speech in Cairo, there were two interpretations of this speech. Uh, interpretation of uh, political analysts, and, uh, of course, um, civil society people uh, and even also think tanks here in the United States that this is a message of engagement with the Arab people and the Arab governments. Uh, but there was another interpretation, which is the interpretation of the Arab government. Uh, the interpret this, this governmental interpretation concluded that the speech, it is a message of engagement with the Arab governments and the disengagement with the Arab people. I leave it to find what is on the ground, what was the 
uh, correct interpretation. Thank you very much. And thank you again for Michelle and the Carnegie. Thank you very much, Behe. Uh, Amal Basha. Thank you very much. Um, let me first thank Karen Gay for this opportunity to, to, to talk to you and to uh, interact with the uh, such uh, august uh, audience. Ten years ago, I came to Washington, D.C., and I met a lot of people. Some were asking me, where are you from? I said, from Yemen. And they asked, East Yemen or West Yemen? And then I was mad. I mean, why my country is not famous? Why these people do not know Yemen? Yemen is the, the great civilization, the queen of Sheba, the, the dams, the, you know, the terraces, the mountains, the Amal Basha. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's, it, it takes just uh, 10 years. And now wherever I go, if anybody asks me, especially when I'm in the West, where are you from? I'm from a country that is beneath Saudi Arabia. I don't tend to, t to, to say that I'm from Yemen. Yes, Yemen has become, you know, um, equal to the terms of the, the terrorist uh, land or the, the, the land of the terrorists after September 11. Especially now, maybe we had the, the privilege now to have uh, Yemen to be the capital of the Qaeda uh, um, of the Arabian Peninsula, regional now. It, before we were just you know sending some terrorists to to some countries, but now we have a regional base. So this is the only development in my country. Nothing is developed in that country. If you look at the human development ranks. Nothing is developing in terms of uh, health, education, water, environment, security. Mm -hmm. Everything is deteriorating except this fact. And the other facts that security is very developed in Yemen in terms of the number of the uh, agencies. We have the national security. We have the state security. We have the central security. And we have the guard security, and we have the private security. Oh my God, all of these securities, and we are in Yemen, are very scared. We don't have any sense of security, although of these developed many uh, apparatus that uh, created to uh, ensure our security. So why we are now having all of this, of course, the whole region, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not a, a region that is a, a good environment for human development or for, hu for, human, for, for human rights respect. We, all the activists from this region, we are suffering. <laughs> but he mentioned me and some other friends, but all human rights activists, they are fighters. And they are the future victims maybe for, for any kind of violation. So we are operating as our president Ali Abdullah Saleh is saying that um, like dancing over the head of snakes. <laughs> I, I think that the snakes is everywhere, it, starting from Egypt to Morocco to Yemen. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous uh, situation when we are talking about human rights or we want to do something about human rights. Well, Bahi mentioned that here there are some minority who are friends of human rights or, or democracy. Actually, I'm not aware who, how many numbers we have who are friends of our uh, of human rights or how, or how many enemies we have. I'm not uh, an academician. I'm not a politician. I'm not uh, a person who really spends a lot of time reading reports. I mean, it gives me headache. I am I am a person who is working on the ground. I have an office on a daily basis. We are receiving. Tens of requests, tens of complaints. People are tortured, detained, forced disappeared. Women are beaten. Children are getting married at the age of 9 and 10 and 11. We receive reports of girls who are dying. Ilham Shui, maybe you, you follow up in, 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 in some of the newspaper. She died three days after she got married. And we were saying she's a child, and the government should feel ashamed 
she should put a, 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 a law to prevent um, early marriage or what I call it early crime. They said, no, she's not young. I mean, then we have to, to argue and then to look at the, uh, the report of the autopsy and then she was 16. I said, yes, you were saying 13, but she is 16. And we said, okay. It is, if, if she's 16 and died, it means that even at the age of 16, she is not supposed to, to, to get married. So the violations in, 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 in the whole region, it varies, but it's there. And the, the state's government, or, or the American governments, they, they, they are unfortunately, throughout the, the years, it's not just now because of Ob Obama's policy, you know, I've been listening to the, the national strategy and the human rights strategy and all of this nice, it's, it's very nice to have all of these strategies and, and <laughs> policies. I mean, whatever you are going to help, it, it will help. Okay, we have no problem with the papers or the wordings. Of course, I mean, you are paying a lot of time to make the best that you can, mm, that you feel it, it, it's the, the possible way to help and to support the people of that region. Well, that's fine. But what is on reality now? What is the reality? Some trivial mistakes can really damage all, all the good papers that you are spending time and expertise and, and, and working on. I can give you two mistakes. Two mistakes happened in, in the last few months or this year. Of course now, uh, Yemen now is uh, undergoing the, a very uh, intensive uh, security cooperation with the, with the Obama's administration and started uh, even before. The first mistake was in Al Majala in December. I don't remember the date. Maybe because I, I don't want to remember that. But let me tell you that when uh, during the elections, the, the American election, we as women activists, we were, uh, excuse me for the Democrats, we are supporting Hillary because we want to see women, especially in the, in the United States. You know, that will create a change uh, all over the world. Regardless, we don't know exactly who is Hillary or wh whatever is going to do, what is her mentality, what is, but we need to see women, a strong woman. Yes, she's, and she was the wife of the <laughs> Bill Clinton and uh, who has has a good uh, reputation in that in that uh, region, but we were really as women activists. Okay, we want to have a woman. Okay, black and white or whatever. But came uh, Obama and he's uh, nice looking and eloquent and uh, and he is also representing a minority. And we, the women, we are also minorities regardless of our number in terms of the quality or the, 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 the rights that we are receiving, we are still treated as minorities. So he is, he is, there is something in common between Obama and the women all over the world. He is representing the minority. Uh, minority. So we were so happy to have Obama and, uh, and we said, okay, sorry for Hillary, maybe next time we'll support women when, <laughs> <laughs> when we have uh, no such a, a, a good uh, competitors, okay? And then we're following to his statement in, uh, in, in Istanbul and in, in Cairo. And we were so happy. Now there is really, he is saying what he's saying, a change. There is a change in his discourse, a change in the, in the content, a change in the mentality. And we were feeling closer. Okay, now maybe as human rights activists or women activists, this kind of mentality also is going to help and support, although the previous policy of Bush or, or, or the others, they were also helping. And uh, I can see now uh, my friend uh, Laura Scholz from, uh, uh, she used to work in Yemen. I mean, uh, we had great uh, relationships with, with the, many of the um, people working in the embassies, especially those who are efficient and really hardworking people. Thank you, Laura, for all the work that you were, used to do in the past. But now came to what's happening on the ground, the security cooperation. Look, Yemen is a very poor country. I mean, whatever you think that you are going to help Yemen, it's going to help. If you think about education, health, poverty, uh, environment, water, 
uh, women, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it, we'll call it, it's a virgin country. Everything, if you put there, it can uh, have, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a fertile. It, it can uh, lead to, but now for this security issue, I'll tell you, the, these incidents that happened in December, the attack or the strike in one of the operation to attack on the terrorists in Yemen, in Al Ma'jala, around 52 or 53 civilians killed, men, women, and children in rural areas, in an attempt to kill or to, to assassinate one or two of the terrorists, suspect terrorists. And uh, in the second day, but Tamara has, uh, you know, maybe uh, corrected me. In the second day, we heard, I mean, we read in the newspaper that Obama sent a letter to the government of Yemen um, congratulating Yemen for the quality action. Yes, I mean, we are the lovers of Obama, of Obama, we did not believe it. We said, no, 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 it, it cannot be. Maybe there are some people in the embassy cannot really tell what is exactly happening, misinformation, lack of uh, information, or deliberate, you know, hiding of information. Otherwise, it cannot be. It cannot be that 52 people, ruler, poor, died of the strike, for this uh, 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 airplane without pilot, how, how do you say this? Drone. Drone. Hmm? Drone. 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 Drone, whatever, okay? <laughs> People were killed, and then we are receiving, and yes, I mean, it could be, I mean, we don't trust our government, you know, they, they lie, they loot, they do everything, but we do, we did expect at least, you know, a correction from the embassy to say, no, no, no this is not happening, this, this is not what happened, I mean. Mm? It cannot be that a, congratul a congratulation letter going to think about the, the pain of the people in that area and what, what kind of reaction. You know, the pain of one person, yes, you can, you can erase it with time, but the pain of the whole village cannot. Maybe that will continue and it, it, it will have an impact for longer time. And think that people in that area, in the south, because now what is happening? There is now a political use and investment for the fight against terror. In Yemen, we are a country of war. We have lust for war. We have a war in the south. We have a war in the north. We have a, now a war against Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda suspects. The other incidents also, that was in Marib, the secretary general of one of the local council. He, 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 he was an uh, intermediary between the government and the Al-Qaeda who are there in, in, in Marib. He was, and he is a very famous man and he is a tribal man. He was sent to have negotiation with the people who are in the ru very uh, remote area. And then what happened also again, the same mistake. And he was killed. That was just three weeks ago happening. And then what happened now? In that very, I mean, strong and vigorous tribe in Yemen, a war against the government. A war, and we have a power cut, and because the, the power station is, is based there. It's, a, it's an oil, uh, 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 where the oil are there. And we had power cut for almost two weeks. Because started the war now, we, you have 50,000 armed to, eth, uh, to, to teeth um, to tribal men. And another war is just because of a simple stupid mistake, killing the person that you are sending to have negotiation. So no matter now how policies you are doing, I mean, nice uh, the strategies, I mean, just be careful about such simple mistakes. And even, and, and even using this, this, this uh, preemptive uh, what, strikes or whatever, I mean, couldn't be a better way to, to, to fight terrorism and to ensure security without having this collateral damage that is... <laughs> Uh, that cannot be really uh, clean, 
in term and in short on longer time. So now this this um, security measures in the whole Arab countries now. Whoever is a political opponent, they are represented as terrorists, suspects of, uh, have relation with Al-Qaeda. You know, they have some friends of Al-Qaeda. They have some links with Al-Qaeda. So it has been used as a, as a weapon for us to uh, do all of this. In Yemen, the whole, I mean, there, there have been a massacre of the journalists. Ten or nine uh, newspapers and magazines independent professional. They were accused of security issues and they are tackling security issues. They are engaging in, I don't know what. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. <laughs> and uh, in the name also of the national security, the protection of the unity. We have now so many issues and even women's rights, women's rights now. We are talking about violence, child marriage, and our Terrorists, but not who are holding the, the, the guns or uh, bombing themselves, but they are terrorists in their, in their mentality. They have called us the, the new to, uh, tsunami. The women activists who are fighting against uh, the child marriage and uh, trying to put an end for such a crime, they call us uh, the, the new tsunami, and they have declared jihad against us. Can you believe it? There is a jihad against the women activists now. The same jihad against the Western who are trying to know to destroy the Islam and the civilization of the Arab or whatever. I'm sorry for being too, too long time. Thank you very much. Normally, I'm a stickler for ending our events on time, but uh, with your permission, those of you who can stay, I would like to extend a bit till 1.30 or maybe a little bit after so that we can have a discussion because I know we have in the audience uh, a lot of expertise and I, I would guess a lot of questions. So we've heard from uh, our speakers from the administration that they believe they, they have, uh, they've come up with a sort of serious strategy and have serious efforts to promote human rights uh, in the Arab world. I think we heard from both of them, particularly some very important statements about Egypt and about the kind of a critical moment uh, and, and test that, that the situation in Egypt now presents. But at the same time, I think we've heard there's a gap. There's a gap between what the uh, administration is doing and believes it's doing and, and what how it is perceived uh, in the region. And I think we heard from uh, both of our um, regional activists that, that they feel that the, um, the governments in the region still feel that this engagement is primarily government to government uh, and that also perhaps the administration has committed a number of harmful missteps and uh, as Amal said that human rights advocates in the region feel that they're dancing over the heads of snakes and they they still don't not sure they have many friends in Washington so uh, let's open this up for your questions we have several microphones in the room uh, please wait for the microphone to come to you uh, give me your name and the affiliation uh, that you have. I'm going to take a group of questions. Please do keep your questions concise. No statements, please. Just questions so that we can, uh, so that we can give everyone a chance. Thank you, Michelle, for doing these uh, uh, conferences. They are very helpful. And, and uh, education is very important in these issues. My name is Ali Liami from the Center for Democracy and Human Rights in Saudi Arabia here in Washington, D.C. And since I'm talking about conferences, we are organizing a conference on the 20th of July on capital health. So I invite you all to look at our website and is come and participate. Is that a question, Ali? My question, <laughs> I know, I have to, look, I have to advertise myself a little bit here. I'm a poor guy. Uh, <laughs> My question is, uh, uh, Mike, I couldn't think of any better person to do the work you are doing except yourself. I know you before, and I know you are doing your best, and I really salute you, sir, for what you do. I just hope people listen to you. Uh, there's a person here I would like to recognize from Saudi Arabia who should have been in this podium. Mr. Ibrahim al Bukutib here is the only person in Saudi Arabia who started and supervise and manage an organization called the Human Rights First, 
And if anybody needs, deserve your support, you all should support him. It's the only independent, non-government, non-licensed human rights organization. My friend, thank you. Is there a question? My question actually, yes. Uh, to to uh, uh, Tamara, you said that we Americans are actually empowering the individuals in the, mid in the Arab world to determine their destiny. I like the vibes of these things. In the meantime, the people who are on the ground, Mr. Uh, Hassan and Ms. Basha, and I agree with them because I do these things too here in Washington, D.C. Things are actually going backward since this administration took over. And I can give you one example in Saudi Arabia. And, sure. and to, uh, this is my yeah. question is coming. Let's listen. This is dialogue here. This, my, th look, <laughs> and, and 2005, there was election in Saudi Arabia, which was a farce, but it was election because Bush pressured the Saudis, and, when Ob and it was supposed to take place in 2009. When Obama took over here in Clinton, King Abdullah automatically postponed it for two years. My question to our people, Mike and Tamara, what empowerment are we doing? What support are we going to the people? We are engaged with the Arab regimes instead of supporting people who promote human rights. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. This gentleman. Wait for the microphone, please. It's, it's right behind you. Thank you. My name is Abdul Wahab Hassan. I'm with the Egyptian American Alliance. And for long, the Egyptians have accepted the abuse in the police stations and in the prisons and also the election as a fate. But now there is a sign of rebellions all over the country, in Sinai, South, South in the Delta, everywhere. Uh, now, is, is America is going to really have some kind of international monitoring to the coming election. That's number one. Number two, is there is any hope that the light can reach the people in the prisons? Can we have cameras in the police stations or in the prisons? People are really abused, unbelievable abuse. So, and if they die, no one knows about it. And as, as we have seen, they have fabricated Cases against the boy who, who, who got killed, like he is a, a, a severe criminal. So we don't trust no more the, uh, the prosecution. We don't trust the autopsies, the government autopsies. That's ridiculous. The system is collapsing. If, if there is Question. no... So uh, are we going to uh, do any monitoring to the coming? And are, can we have anything to have cameras in the prisons? and the police station. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, in the middle here, Laura Schultz. Come forward, please. No, my microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry, we'll get to you. Oh, there we go, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Laura Schultz from the Congressional Research Service. Thank you very much to the panelists and Amel for your kind comments. My question is for Amel and Bahe, uh, following up on something that Tamara raised, namely the demographic reality that is not just in the Middle East right now, but really to come in the next couple of decades. What do you think should be the forward-looking strategy of civil society in terms of really engaging and empowering youth so as to prepare for the for the coming future particularly in your countries thank you thank you this gentleman uh, you. wait for the microphone please over right there thank you uh, thank you mr hassan and uh, miss basha for raising uh, two of the most important issues uh, to me personally the coptic plight in egypt and the woman plight in all the muslim world so my question to Mr. Bosner and uh, Ms. Wittes is, uh, what is the American administration is doing regarding the killing of many, many Christians in Egypt, which Mr. Hassan said, the Copts, as you know. And just for example, uh, the last Christmas Eve, six Coptes were uh, killed coming out from the church after the Christmas Mass and many, many other killings. What the American administration doing about the raping and forcing women to Islam in Egypt and mainly raping even and beating women, Muslim women in Egypt just because they don't wear the hijab, <clears throat> throw acid in their faces, etc. What is 
specifically you are doing. Thank you. Uh, one question in the back there. Can you speak up a little bit? We're having a hard time hearing you. Another mic. Mohammed Abdullah, I'm a human rights activist from Syria who's refugee, cannot go back, and my father and brother as well, both in prison currently. Uh, last week, the State Department mentioned my father's case along with Mohammed al Hassani case, and I want to thank you very much for that. My question is for Michelle at first. Based on what you evaluate, the, the human rights support in Middle East is getting better. Well, the people came from Middle East saying the situation is getting much worse. And the second question is for Tamara. Ma'am, I really appreciate your time. I respect you. I like to come to all conference you came to, to talk, but each time you're talking about you're raising safety, stability, security, not human rights. Last, last uh, meeting in NED, you said safety 19 times. I was counting the points each time you're saying safety. With all of my respect, my question is, do you agree with Amal that you're building great strategies in, in the paper, but in the field, you are making a huge mistakes with approaching the government. At the same time, they are approaching the human rights activists or the human rights societies, and that's make the the interpreting the the governmental interpreting. Mr. Hassan said it's uh, more in the government Arab government's favor than the, uh, the society uh, civil society favor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll we'll start with these questions, and I'll come back for a second round. Okay. Uh Tamara, since you have a specific question, why don't we start with you? Okay, thank you. Um, and, and thanks to everyone. I, th I think that this was a, a whole set of very important issues that were raised. Um, let me try and address the issue of uh, how we engage with civil society and how we engage with governments. And I think that there's, you know, there, there's been some uh, suggestion from Bahay and, and from those uh, who ask questions that there's a sort of a zero-sum game here, that uh, to the extent that we're talking to governments, that that's bad for civil society activists, and to the extent that we're engaging with civil society activists, that in and of itself somehow constrains governments. And I guess that I, I would reject the notion that things actually work that way. Um, the, you know, there, there is uh, a question of U.S. policy. There's a question of the human rights situation in the region. Uh, and in the middle, there's an important variable, which is the behavior of Arab governments, okay? Um, and how do we impact that behavior? Now, civil society activists, somebody said we're working to empower civil society activists, so let me be very clear. Civil society activists in the region are doing a whole heck of a lot. All we're trying to do is give them a boost in their activities. They are empowering themselves. Um, so... Uh, it seems to me that civil society mm -hmm. works to affect the behavior of governments. Um, that happens both through civil society groups here in the U.S., like Human Rights First, uh, and civil society groups in the region, and often working in partnership. And it's also uh, a role that we believe that we can effectively play to help bolster the role that civil society plays uh, in the region in trying to affect government behavior. We also dialogue with governments, and we dialogue with them about interests we have in common, and we dialogue with them about issues on which we have disagreements. And we speak very frankly to them about our concerns on democracy and human rights. And we believe this is not only important, but essential to trying to make progress on these issues on the ground. So I don't see this as either one or the other. It seems to me um, that that is not an approach that it's going to move us down the road. Um, and as Michelle has said many, many times, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, I think that's what we're doing. Um, and so even though not all of the dialogue is going to be a public dialogue, that doesn't mean that it isn't taking place and it doesn't mean that it isn't very frank. Uh, there were just a couple of specific questions that that I, I uh, hope that one of you, uh, either Mike or Tamara, would would address. Okay, is the United States going to um, support or push for international monitoring of the Egyptian elections? What about the question of the Saudi elections? Do we feel that um, the you know that the the government of Saudi Arabia felt felt free to postpone them indefinitely because of a perceived lack of interest from the United States? Uh, let me answer the first and also the question about uh, Naga Hammadi and the cops, and then maybe Tamari will say something about Saudi. Um, we, we absolutely support the notion of uh, independent monitoring of the elections, both 
by Egyptians and international. Um, I think the, the uh, local observers are going to be accepted much more readily than international observers. But I think our view is you need both. And so, you know, from where I sit, um, we're watching the parliamentary elections very closely. It's not just monitoring. It's also the process that leads up to the election. Our party's going to be able to organize. Our voters going to be allowed to register. Is there going to be uh, open access and public debate about all the issues that are being discussed? And then is the election itself going to be fair? So I think we're, we're, this is a priority. We're engaged in the process. We regard both the parliamentary and the presidential elections as critical tests of, uh, uh, of the government's uh, commitment to democracy. And it's an open question, frankly, as to how open they're going to be. Uh, on the, uh, the plight of the Coptic Christians, I agree with you entirely. I was, again, I was in Egypt in January. I met with representatives of the Christian community. I raised the issue of the killing of the six uh, uh, Coptic Christians in front of the church um, very actively. I raised it publicly in a press conference. Um, we raised concerns, frankly, also about the decision of the government to use the emergency law to prosecute the three people they identified. We also raised concerns about it broadening that investigation. So we're very mindful of it. We continue to raise it. It's a, it's a, I think it is a disturbing part of what uh, is a trend of sectarian uh, violence, and we're very mindful of it, and we're going to continue to press on it. Anything on the Saudi uh, issue? And there's also the, the demographic uh, issue and the youth? Well, that was for yeah. yeah. I mean, on, on Saudi Arabia, I'll just say, you know, I, I think that as we discuss these issues with every government in the region, we also discuss them with the government of Saudi Arabia. It's, there's no exceptionalism there. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that what I see, and certainly on my most recent visit to Saudi Arabia earlier in the year, is that there is a lot of dynamism within Saudi society. There are a lot of people who are discussing issues, even in the press sometimes, uh, issues that weren't necessarily open for public discussion a few years ago. Everything um, from the issue of gender separation uh, to the to um, the issue of public participation and voice and and corruption, uh, you know, and I think if you look at some of the public debate uh, after the floods in Jeddah, for example, you saw some significant uh, is, you know people raising significant issues about uh, how the government handled all of the issues surrounding construction and um, and contracts and and so on and what led to the tragedies there. So. I see a lot happening within Saudi society. I think there's a lot there to be encouraged about. And I think that one of the things that we can do is support that and also um, try to ensure that the space is open and remains open for that kind of discussion. Election. election is what I asked. And, and there's been a delay in the election, in the plan for elections. And, you know, this is, this is something we continue to discuss. Uh, Amal, would you like to comment on any of these issues, including the demographic issue that Laura raised? Um, well, uh, one of the issues that, uh, was raised about this, uh, the, the U.S. policies and um, themes and uh, issues related um, to the support of civil society, for us, um, the, the, the most important kind of support that uh, Washington or Brussels or whoever is, is willing really to help and support is to recognize the civil society as a real partner in, in, in the development, in, in the policy also making, in consultation. What was the, 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 the good thing about the, uh, the changes in, in the attitudes of the, uh, of the Americans as well as uh, their partners, the uh, European, was what happens in the uh, Forum for Future. The Forum for Future was really an excellent uh, platform where both the decision makers, the officials, and civil society, society they came together and they negotiate and debate face to face in 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 a in a, in a very equal uh, position. Uh, that really what empowers us. That really what what make us feel that we can talk to power mm, at the same level. 
this is the kind of things that we need. What we need also from the from the uh, U.S. government, whenever you are having a measure, whenever you are having an event, whenever there is an issue, include the civil society in your dialogue. I mean, not. I mean, what uh, what I have uh, noticed that we are invited to the embassies for. Uh, small meetings, okay, for the, with the whoever senior people coming from Washington. We don't want this kind of secret meetings. I mean, we are not doing something uh, uh, secret. This should this should be done in a in an open open space that so that the government can hear and listen and see that these people are recognized. They are uh, their views are taken care of or well taken. I mean. Yes, it's it, it it's nice to go to the uh, to the uh, American embassy. It's safe and nice and uh, air conditioned and green. Uh, but this is not the point. The point that things should be uh, in public. So we feel that okay, we are uh, talking and we are discussing issues related to our country's security, uh, human rights, women's rights, development, whatever. Okay, this kind of support that really I want. For the issue of demography, I really, I did not I really understand what, what is meant, but if you are talking, Laura, about the engagement of the youth, yes, I mean, now in the whole Arab world, now there is, uh, there is a revolution coming from the, from the youth, thanks to the internet and the um, cyber world. I mean, and those generations, they are really uh, g going to take over. I mean, for us, you, if you uh, see Bahi and few activists in in, the, in in each country, there are few. You can just name some people from Egypt. You have three, four, five from. But now, I mean, it's it's really an army of activists. I mean, uh, I look ten ten years back, and I see, oh my God! I mean, if we had this number of activists from the youth, I mean, we could have uh, achieved more uh, than before. But uh, believe me, I mean, it's, it's the youth who are coming. We are aging now. Yes, it's an, uh, the, the movement is aging, but there are, there are now uh, promises for, for more voices and more uh, people who are going to take the lead. Yeah. Okay, um, Behe, if you will permit me, I'm going to take a couple of more questions and then I'll give you the first go, okay? And then we'll we'll conclude because we're, we're well over our time. Uh, this gentleman in the front row first. And please, I beg you, please questions, brief questions. Yeah, Ibrahim al mugheti from Saudi Arabia, Human Rights Fair Society. I just want to clarify something that's very dangerous, Tamara said. Whoever hears what she said about Jeddah floods, think that, well, the, and the, uh, the amount, the ceiling, the level of allowing criticism, it means, it means that uh, things are better. You see, Saudi uh, government is just like all the Arab regimes. If you remember Gawar Toshe, whoever knows Syria, I mean, even in a country like Syria, Gawar was allowed to, to critique the government, to allow some of the pressure off. So uh, after Jeddah floods, all of us were angry. The king had to s set a commission, and he had to allow for some public views. But actually, the dialogue is far from being good or strong or transparent. Thank you Thank very you. much. Would you pass the mic to the gentleman right behind you there? Thank you. Very, a brief question, yes, please. Um, uh, Michael Lame, Rethink the Middle East. This is a question for the two State Department officials. What are the tools available to you to, change, to encourage uh, governments to change their policies? I assume it's not accidental. So you raise the question with them. They have a reason for doing what they're doing. What can you play hardball? What sticks, what carrots are available to you to change the behavior of those governments? Okay, thank you. Two last questions, the uh, young woman in the middle. Um, hello, I'm Saram Sefer uh, with the Middle East Youth Initiative Brookings Institution. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is from Mr. Ambahi. Um, in light of the recent um, human rights report um, of Egypt, um, who uh, Hiba Hasuna was the lead author of, um, there was a whole chapter on, on the usage. Oh, Hiba Hasuna? Hasuna. Hiba Handusa. Handusa, oh. sorry. Um, sorry, my mistake. Um, there was a whole chapter on the youth, uh, situation of youth in Egypt, and that chapter had a strong emphasis on the 
um, the level of education, the quality of education and entrepreneurship in Egypt. So my question is that um, what, what strategies do you propose um, in order to measure the, the quality of education since there's a huge gap, gap between um, the level of education, the, the, the number of educated um, youth in Egypt and most of the Arab countries um, versus the number of people who are employed? And also okay, th thank you. We have we have one more person. We need to get a question from. I know it's getting late, so I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Hussein. I am with the Alliance of Egyptian Americans. I am originally from Egypt, but I'm speaking here as myself. I'd like to, Mr. Behay, a question has been bothering me for a while. The gentleman asked what tools the State Department has. One of the tools I believe it has is foreign assistance. Israel, after Israel, Egypt, the largest assistance. Unfortunately, the military assistance is continuing and the economic and development assistance is shrinking drastically. Uh, what is wrong? I'm, I'm really wondering, what's wrong with putting a condition that unless there is progress in the human rights and democracy front, there will be a transfer from military to, the, the, to economic development assistance? I'm not saying cut the assistance, but stop rearming the army and give the people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're, I'm going to give the speakers each just really a minute or so uh, to conclude. I think we'll uh, go Behe and Amal, then Tamara, and we'll give you the last word, Mike. Okay. Please. Uh, I will start by the last question. The um, uh, the qu question of conditioning, uh, condition the uh, U.S. aid to Egypt or whatever Arab country. I think this is a very unpopular issue. Um, I would uh, I would uh, uh, think of such option if uh, United States has nothing to deal and to, to influence the um, uh, Egyptian government behavior. In fact, it has a lot to, to, to make. And this is not only the, uh, I mean, to follow on to respect and uh, human rights. And this is not uh, the only uh, mean. And the uh, previous experience, I mean, uh, which related to the uh, using the uh, financial uh, assistance to, uh, to con uh, to condition to, to change the policies, it fa in fact, Previous uh, experience proves that it uh, it works the other way. People who are the most victim of uh, um, such uh, 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 such uh, uh, such a development or such action. I uh, concerning what should be what could be done um, if it is not uh, the the aid. Uh, I think um, I, I would be very modest, in fact, and I, am, I would be very modest because the context of the U.S. Uh, uh, performance in the region is uh, very disturbing concerning uh, promotion of human rights and democracy. I think that uh, the United States should review and look uh, uh, again, into the style of engagement which has been developed uh, and adopted by the uh, President Obama administration. Because as uh, I try to explain, it, it mainly helps uh, for more and more repression. This is what we witness, and I think that the uh, oppressive regimes in the um, in the region they inter inter uh, um, they rightly or correctly interpreted the Cairo speech. This is what happened after one year, and even after one year. Several governments in the same occasion of one year, we are coming to discuss and analyze other country, other the governments, Tunisian government in the same occasion, they adopted a law which criminalized human rights defenders. If they participated in a forum like this and they exchange information which 
may lead to uh, uh, harm or do something bad for the economic interest of the Tunisia. And the, uh, the targeted mm -hmm. uh, people of that is mainly human rights defenders, and then even by names, and some of them are in the same room now. Um, this is what not, I, I don't think that this is what happen if they uh, think that the message of the Cairo speech would be uh, implemented. Um, I think uh, uh, also what could be done that uh, the United States should stop doing bad things. I give several examples of that. Uh, blessing rigged elections. This is, uh, of course, not good for human rights. So I am not asking to what to do as good, but at least to stop doing bad. Um, uh, unconditional support for very bloody regime uh, like Yemen, as uh, Amal uh, explained more and deliberated more and more, this is, would be a positive uh, step uh, forward. Uh, uh, helping the Egyptian government to limit the space of the civil society by supporting its uh, uh, inter uh, definition for what is, is NGO and what is not, it is terrible uh, contribution to the uh, repression of the uh, uh, civil society. In fact, we, yesterday we had a meeting with the Under Secretary Maria Oteo and uh, the, the, we were told that even now, more Arab governments, uh, more governments, even not Arab, are looking to uh, copy and paste this and asking the United States to uh, to translate that in its uh, uh, bilateral uh, cooperation relation. Uh, Behe, I think we, we have to give the others okay, a chance. Thank, thank you. you very much. Any brief brief finishing uh, comment? Well, uh, to support the civil society and the human rights, I mean, for us, the moral and, and, and political support is, is far more important than any technical or programs. One statement in support of a detainee or a, a, a person who is tortured or a, a girl who is married at, at the mountains of Yemen and died, that's for us counts. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Tamara, any brief uh, concluding remarks? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just make one very brief comment about freedom of association because I think it's very important to make our position on this issue crystal clear, uh, which is that, as Mike said at the outset, this is a concern for us that we see, yes, across the region and beyond the Middle East, uh, governments that are seeking to constrain freedom of association, constrain civil society in their own countries, and also constrain the ability of those civic organizations to associate freely with people outside their borders. Mm -hmm. All of these are violations of the fundamental right to freedom of association. This is something we oppose in every context, and we oppose it energetically, and we oppose it vocally. Uh, and we seek to support freedom of association not only through the, such public statements and through our diplomacy, but also through our direct support for local civil society, because I do think that governments in the region pay attention to where we put our money. And I think that that's one very strong symbol of our support, as well as a practical uh, method of support. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, um, d just a, a broad uh, generalized comment. Uh, th there seemed to be in this whole discussion a kind of disconnect between the Washington types, me and, and Tamar, and, and our civil society activists from, from the region. And I think there's probably less disagreement than is obvious, but I just want to say three things. I think, first of all, assessment of what's actually going on, I don't think there's that much difference. There are particular things that have been said here I wouldn't agree with, but I don't think any of us would say that there's a, a great trend, a positive trend on democracy and human rights in the region. Mm -hmm. There's a serious problem. There's a serious negative trend in many, many countries, and we've got to be attentive to that. I think we all recognize that. Secondly, there seems to be some disconnect between the sort of efforts that we laid, Tamara and I laid out in terms of trying to set broad administration policy and action on the ground. And I would say the civil society is a perfect example. We need to have a unified policy in government that says we're going to fight restrictions on 
uh, NGOs, funding, registration, et cetera, across the board. It's taken a while to get that kind of thinking on a global sense. There are 30 some countries in the world that have enacted new restrictions on NGOs. They're not all in the Middle East, and they are learning from each other. That's now something that we're really generating internally within the government. It has an effect on everybody then. It affects policy on the ground. The third and last thing is Bahi's comment about style, the style of engagement. The truth is I probably traveled to now already 12 or 15 countries in the world. There is not one style for the United States government. In some ways, I wish there was. I wish it was the way I wanted it, at least. But the truth is, embassies have their own personality. Ambassadors have their own personality. Countries have their own history and relation with governments. In, the re in regions, I was just in the Central Asia, in the Middle East. I've gone to neighboring countries, and the way in which the United States carries out its policy is dramatically different from one to the next. I can't tell you there's a grand theory behind that. Our engagement is dependent on a whole lot of factors. My job, tomorrow's job, is to make sure to the extent possible human rights, support for civil society is part of that. I can't say we're succeeding everywhere, but we're certainly trying. Thank you. I think we've had an important conversation today, an important exchange about what the U.S. administration thinks it's doing and how human rights advocates in the region think it's working. Uh, I hope that, that this will just be the opening of an ongoing conversation. Please join me in thanking Amal Basha, Bahadine Hassan, Tamara Wittes, Michael Posner.